People who just look at pictures are different than people who commit contact offenses. Um, they have different psychological traits. And there really actually isn't very much of, a, of an overlap. Hello and welcome to another episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast vodcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. I'm very fortunate to be here today with Professor Ira Elman, who is a sex offence law and policy expert. Thank you very much for talking with us. Well, glad to have a chance to talk to you. So, uh, before we delve into anything else, um, is there anything you'd like to tell us about your background? How did you get into this area? Uh, well, I mean, I started out thinking I was going to be a psychologist, and I went to graduate school in psychology, in child psychology, actually. Um, but one thing led to another, the Vietnam War interrupted my education, uh, um, and I ended up going to law school, um, but, uh, and then followed that up with uh, work in the legislature and Congress, um, I clerked for some judges, but I ended up being a, becoming an academic, a, a law professor, working with law and psychology, and I spent most of that career doing family law, working with psychologists on various uh, issues in family law. And I thought it would be nice now that I'm moving toward retirement to do something do something uh, else, something different. And um, I knew somebody who'd become involved in a, in a, in a case involving a prosecution for possession of child pornography. And I started looking into that, and um, I just found the issues compelling. Um, and so I wrote an article. It was uh, sort of the last article that I did while I was still officially employed as a as a law professor on that topic and on the uh, confusion uh, in a Supreme Court, in a particular Supreme Court case, especially about three offense statistics on people who've committed sexual offenses, and that that article, sort of my, my my as I say, the last thing I wrote as a fully employed law professor, turned out to be probably the the most widely circulated piece. I'd ever written, and it got lots of attention, and people started coming to me, asking me uh, if I could help with this or that. And so in my, I retired about five years ago, and, um, and basically a lot of my time since then has been spent on this question and on uh, writing amicus briefs, briefs on behalf of uh, a group of scholars, law and social science scholars, who particularly interested in this topic, trying to uh, help the courts to understand what the, what the actual facts are, because there's so much confusion uh, in this area. So what is the biggest uh, public misconception about uh, sex offence registries and, and people who end up on them? I, you know, I guess it, if I try to capsule it, 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 it all emerges from that label, sex offender which is the way people commonly talk uh, about, about this topic. They keep talking about sex offenders, uh, and there are registries in every state. Federal law uh, pushes the states to have these registries, and they're called sex offender registries. And that term um, kind of converts uh, a single event in a person's life a single thing they did that uh, was, was, was a crime into a frightening and unchangeable personal attribute. That's what it sounds like. And that's how people interpret it. But it's a legal classification. It's not a psychological diagnosis. And, and that legal classification is applied to um, people with who vary enormously. They vary enormously in what they did that got them in this problem. They vary enormously in their psychological traits, uh, in their demographic traits, in their uh, capacity to change, in what their problem was in the first place. And, and that um, they vary as much as uh, any other group of people who've been convicted of a crime. 
So this misconception actually comes up again and again, doesn't it, in a lot of the briefs that you've worked on with this uh, Amicus team of yours. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about how that team came together? Uh, okay, so there's actually two teams. Right. Um, there's, uh, the, there's the team of social scientists who've signed on to my briefs. And um, there's about 19 of them now. Not everyone's been on every brief, but there's been somewhere between 16 and 19 on, uh, on each of the briefs. That actually started um, in the very first brief I worked on uh, in the Matthews case that the California Supreme Court just decided uh, a month or so ago. And I just wrote to one of the uh, the people that I knew, and I, I knew from his work, I didn't know him personally, but I'd read his work, Carl Hansen, who had uh, done a lot of work on uh, assessing um, uh, uh, risk of people who committed an offense, and then Michael Cito, who's a great expert in child pornography, and they agreed to work with me on it, and then I started just sending out other people, and I discovered that people were interested in, in participating, this was an opportunity for them to tell someone that mattered about what they had learned in their research. Well, it's interesting that you should say that because Prostasia Foundation came together in a very similar way. Um, I observed from my particular background some problems in the way that we deal with uh, uh, sex offence policy and preventing uh, child sexual abuse. And I reached out to some other experts who said, you know, from our perspective, we've also got problems and we'd like to come together with you to work on them together. So um, it was interesting also that you mentioned this uh, Matthews case, which I think uh, was mentioned uh, in a series of favourable articles in the um, LA Times. Can you tell us a little bit more about that case? Sure. Um, so I think most people are familiar with the idea of mandatory reporters. They know that uh, uh, teachers or medical personnel are required to report to authorities, usually child protective services, if they in their work come across somebody, who, a child who's in some imminent danger from someone. And so they're supposed to report that so that people, the authorities can step in and protect the child from that uh, threatened harm. And so that law, that uh, therapists, people who do psychotherapy, uh, have also been mandatory reporters, and that's been a long-standing law in California. And, and I think most people think it's probably a good idea. Uh, um, but what happened was uh, the legislature um, a few years ago amended that law to say that um, uh, a therapist who has a client who tells the therapist that uh, he's looked at pictures of minors, explicit pictures of minors. Um, now you must report that person. Now, what's interesting about that is the therapist already had to report such a client if the therapist believed that that client posed an imminent threat of harm to a child. So by adding this provision to the law, all the legislature really did is say, well, now you also have to report people whom you do not believe pose an imminent threat of harm. That's the effect of the amendment. And it really makes very little sense because uh, some people who come to the therapist are not going to be uh, uh, posing any threat to any child. They, they have pictures they've found on the internet of children whose whereabouts and identity uh, are completely unknown to them. Um, and, and one of the things we were able to show in the brief through the social science evidence that there is, is that people who just look at pictures are different than people who commit contact offenses. Um, they have different psychological traits. And there really actually isn't very much of, a, of an overlap. I mean, some people do both, and then they'd be in the category of people who are contact offenders. But people who have only looked at pictures... Uh, and there's a lot of data to show this, uh, don't usually, you know, so they have different psychological traits that make them much less likely to engage in a contact defense. But in any event, if the therapist thought that their client was somebody who might have, a con might be planning on or has committed a contact defense, of course, they would report that. But this 
this law requires them to report people who they think are not, who are just looking at the pictures and who may have come to them because they've encountered the pictures, they've discovered their interest in them, and they're themselves bothered, disturbed by their interest, mm. and go to the therapist to seek help to conquer that interest. And now the therapist has to report them, which, of course, does not encourage them to seek help. Yeah, it's the opposite of what we really <laughs> want them to do. Um, it's We also, at Procedure, have been working with some experts in New York who have set up a new clinic there on the model of... Uh, what they do in Germany, which uh, oh, yes. is a little different, and it does encourage people to come forward uh, to get help yeah. with this problem. Um, and uh, in New York State, uh, there isn't such a law as the one that you're challenging or helping to challenge here in California. Yeah, well, I mean, we did get a favorable decision uh, about a month ago in that case, um, which the, some therapists who had challenged it because they didn't want to have to report every client no matter what they thought about the client. Um, the, the, uh, their challenge had been dismissed by the courts below and the California Supreme Court said, no, no, you've got to hear this evidence about whether this is really advancing the public safety rationale that's behind it because maybe it really isn't, which is, of course, our point. And so now that's been sent back to the lower courts to think about that. Mm -hmm. So you've got another uh, amicus brief that you're filing today as it happens, as we're recording this, 23rd of January. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that brief? Yeah, now that's, a, uh, that's an issue. That case raises an issue that I was very glad to be able to to address uh, in, a, in a brief to the California Supreme Court because it was an opportunity perhaps to educate them a little bit. Um, because what you've got is um, some provisions that have been adopted by the voters um, that allow for people who are currently serving very long sentences in prison because of all the enhancements that were adopted at various times to, you know, during the get tough era. Uh, so you have people serving 15, 20 year sentences who, who's only, or really the offense that they're in prison for is normally a much shorter sentence, but there've been all these enhancements. So what's an example of an enhancement? What could increase your sentence from four years to 20 years? Well, okay. So for example, um, suppose you um, uh, burgled a vacation home and then you come back and you do it again. Okay, so you've served your sentence, you do it again, and then they catch you at burgling the vacation room again. Well, your, your sentence will be doubled, uh, um, and there may also be other enhancements because it's a second strike, uh, and, and these enhancements get piled on top of one another. And so somebody who um, might ordinarily be serving, I say, a four-year sentence uh, is suddenly serving, uh, you know, a 12 or 13 or 14 year sentence. And so what um, what these uh, laws that, that were adopted by the people do, uh, say, well, someone who's served their really their basic sentence, they've already done that. They're eligible to seek parole. They may not get parole. The parole board is not uh, too lax about giving parole, but they can seek it. And the, bo the, the board can assess them as that individual and decide whether or not it makes sense to allow this person out on parole. Uh, but what the California Department of um, Corrections and Rehabilitation, those are the people who run the prisons and the parole, and you know the parole officers work for them, what they, they adopted a regulation that said, well, that's all fine, but we're just going to say that anybody who has to register as a, a, a sex offender uh, on the registry is ineligible to be considered. They can't even, th their case can't be considered by the parole board. Um, and, and that means that someone who, for example, um, may have, uh, you know, 20 years earlier had a misdemeanor conviction for, um, because they had pictures of their 17-year-old girlfriend on their cell phone. <laughs> Right? And so they get a misdemeanor conviction for, uh, for possession of child pornography. They're in the registry, uh, um, and they can never seek parole. So this guy who committed a burglary of a vacation home, he's got to serve his 15 years. He can't seek parole after four or five years because many years ago, <laughs> he had once had this conviction. 
and and so that is and they say well this is to protect the public and it's an example of a blanket rule where you just take all the people who've ever done anything that gets them on this very inclusive registry that covers so many different offenses and so many different people uh, you have a blanket rule that applies to all of them without any uh, opportunity to consider them as individuals. In fact, that's the whole point of the rule. Because normally parole is a case-by-case -case process where people are considered individually. So what we've done is, is um, it's an opportunity to show the court, look, these, there's a lot of different kinds of people here. And you can't, you can't um, just have a, allow a blanket rule like this that says all of them are denied the opportunity to seek um, parole and to be considered for it by the parole board. So that's the case. Um, and uh, it also gave us, it's interesting because uh, also we were able to get uh, data that CDCR, the, the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation, their own data that shows that the actual reoffense risk of people for many of these categories of sexual offenses, most of them actually, um, are lower than the reoffense risk posed by a lot of people in prison for other kinds of offenses who are going to be allowed to seek parole. Non-sexual offenses. <laughs> yeah, yeah non-sexual offenses. Um, and so we have a little table, and it's CDCR's own data. <laughs> so, I mean, it's, uh, but they, yeah, any of them. Uh, that's the case, and so I'm, I, I'm hopeful that maybe we'll, uh, we'll be able to educate the court a little bit about this. So a lot of these points are just points that you've been repeating ever since you wrote that famous paper of yours on <laughs> yeah, the frightening and high supposedly that, rate of sex offence yeah. recidivism. Um, how long do you think it's going to be before this knowledge that experts have really yeah. has reached academia, I'm mean, sorry, has reached the judiciary and has reached the broader public? Well, you know, it's two different audiences. The public, I think, is going to be longer um, there have been some articles in the popular press that have uh, now begun to point this out and discuss it in a more measured and in, in informed way than had been the case in the past. We have had some success in courts. Uh, um, there's a really important decision decided uh, a few years ago by the Sixth Circuit Court of Appeals in Michigan. Uh, in which there was a challenge to a lot of the provisions in the sex offender registry there. And that court, um, that appellate court, um, uh, concluded that, you know, there's been a lot of research done since that frightening and high language in, the, uh, in these old Supreme Court cases that I described and uh, exposed in my, uh, in my article. Well, they say, you know, that's not really... The, 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 we now know that that's not really right. Uh, so that's a very high-profile decision. Um, the state of Michigan asked the Supreme Court to review that decision, and um, and they chose not to review it. So um, so that decision still stands as the law. And obviously, we cite that decision in other cases. That's a um, it's an important, important decision written by a very conservative judge who has a, 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 a reputation of, of uh, being, a, you know, more toward the law and order uh, uh, end of the spectrum. But, but she, she, uh, she didn't, she could see through the the uh, the data problems and 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 what the real evidence was. So that was encouraging. Mm. So we've spoken about two of your uh, amicus briefs. Are there any others that you'd like to mention? Well, you know, there's one that was a favorite of mine where we didn't win. But in a way, it, it, it's another example of this horrible um, situation with treating everybody the same. It has to do with an Illinois law. So there's this fellow named Vasquez. That's the, uh, in the case is named after him. It's Vasquez's case, who had been convicted 17 years earlier for possession of pictures of kids, illicit pictures of kids. He'd never been, he was released and had never been charged with any other criminal offense of any kind. Um, he'd married, 
He had um, a nine-year-old daughter, lived in Chicago with his wife and daughter, but they had this law that says that um, you can't live within 500 feet of a long list of places, including a daycare facility, which included if you had a neighbor who took care of some other folks' kids, uh, two kids or more, I think, is what it was, uh, um, that's a daycare facility, and you can't live. You know, and so, and there's no grandfathering. So this poor fellow had had to already move twice because he's living with his family, and one of his neighbors opens up such a facility or gets a license to do it, and the Chicago police come and tell him, you've got to move. And so he had to pull his little girl out of school in the middle of the school year a couple of times already, um, it, because he told he was told he had to move, and so uh, you know, switch her school, move to a different neighborhood, or move, you know, and so this had happened again, and um, and so the, the law was challenged by a friend of mine who practices in Illinois, and who's uh, part of this group of attorneys that I'm involved with who work in this area, and she did not succeed in the in the. Uh, uh, lower courts, and so she asked the Supreme Court to uh, to hear the case. Um, and as I said to the court, all this guy wants to do is to continue living in his family home with his wife and child, where he's lived, uh, with whom he's lived now for, you know, almost two decades, without causing anybody any problem. And that's all he wants to do. And the Illinois Authorities are not allowing him to do it, but the court chose to not hear that case. So that was a big disappointment. But, you know, it's very difficult to get the U.S. Supreme Court to accept to hear a case. Yeah. A tiny, tiny percentage. And so in that sense, not that surprising. But I think about Mr. Vasquez often and uh, how sad that was. Destroying his family, which is one of the things that happens um, you know, uh, people with children who are trying to build a life, turns out these laws burden their children too. Yeah, if, if we're trying to protect children, <laughs> there are different harms that children can suffer. Yeah. And having a family torn apart can be one of them. Um, so if people are interested in these sort of issues, where else can they go to find out more? Well, um, I guess let me, uh, one thing I could suggest, if Reason Magazine, I, I don't know uh, if your readers are familiar with it, but they recently had, I think in their February issue, uh, a, a, an article about a group of women who are running different organizations or involved in different organizations trying to get a more sensible approach to these laws. And in the February issue they uh, uh, of that magazine, which is available online, I think, reason.org or... Uh, yeah, well, reason.com. Um, so there's a ma there's an article in the February issue. I think I'm looking here. I think it was titled "Sex Offender Laws Are Broken. These Women Are Working to Fix Them." Mm -hmm. um, so that would be a kind of uh, uh, a, a glimpse into some of the efforts and what are the concerns that they have. Another thing that you could do is um, this center uh, at the Mitchell Hamline Law School. Uh, that law school is in St. Paul, Minnesota, and they have a, um, uh, a, a something called the Sex Offense Litigation and Policy Resource Center, and they've got a website. Uh, so if you go to from MitchellHamline.edu, you know that uh, that that website, and you look for their Sex Offense Litigation and Policy Center. There's a lot of resources there. That's a website that would give you links to all sorts of articles. Uh, a, a lot, it's very heavy with legal resources, but not exclusively. Uh, um, so that's another good source. Very good. Well, I'll make sure both of those resources are linked to this podcast and uh, people can check them out. So uh, we've just about run out of time. This has been fascinating. Thank you very much uh, for sharing your experiences with us and uh, giving us some, some food for thought. Well, thanks for asking me. I've enjoyed it. And thank you for watching this episode of Prostasia Foundation's podcast, podcast series, Sex, Human Rights and CSA Prevention. We'll be back again next month, so we'll see you then. Bye for now.